This is the tutorial on how to develop and execute OpenCL programs in OpenCL Studio. So all the OpenCL related components are located here under the OpenCL subtree in the tree view. When you do a right mouse click here, you can now see all of the, the elements that are available. And these are basically buffers, uh, programs and platforms. Now these constructs you see right here, they very much reflect the constructs as they're used in the OpenCL specifications. So for example, if I insert a buffer right here, a one-dimensional buffer, and look at the property sheets, you can now see here various attributes that you can specify, such as dimension, uh, storage type, and the access parameters. And the names here are very much the same as you would find them in the OpenCL specification. As a matter of fact, this this node in the tree view uh, simply just encapsulates a call to the uh, CL create buffer function, and here you specify the parameters. So let's have a look now at the property sheet of uh, the OpenCL root node. You can see on the left hand side there is a list of all the OpenCL platforms installed in your system, and then for every platform you can see the devices it contains, and then for every device you can see uh, a list of the OpenCL related properties. Now on the bottom left here you can also see a rendering platform and that's always a GPU. So OpenCL Studio does require a GPU to be present and that will always be the default device. Uh, it uses that GPU for all the, the OpenGL related renderings, that's where all the textures are located, that's where all the shaders are created. And that's where by default it also creates all of the uh, OpenCL buffers and programs. However, you can address a different platform by adding a platform node here under the tree view and then here you can select uh, the other platform and if you create a buffer now this buffer will now reside on the Intel OpenCL platform. Now there is a demo that comes with the download of OpenCL Studio that executes uh, a Redix sort on the Intel platform that is if the Intel uh, OpenCL driver is installed Otherwise, it'll default back to the uh, GPU driver. So I will now move on and show you how to execute a kernel. And in order to do that, we go back to the OpenCL root node here, do a right mouse click and insert a program node. And when I now click on the code tab over here, you can see the OpenCL kernel code for that program. And by default, there is an empty kernel in here. And if we'd like to execute this, we have to go back to the script tag and drag and drop the program into a register. So amongst the event handlers over here, we'll now implement the oncompute event handler. So if you want to execute the kernel, the very first thing you have to do is you have to get a handle to it. So we'll declare a local variable, call it kernel, equals, so now I have to go to the program node and call a function called getKernel. And this one takes a string as an argument which is the name of the kernel. Yeah, let's call it CL kernel. And now we successfully have a uh, handle to the kernel. Now the next thing we need to do is execute this kernel. And for that, we're going to use the CL package. And this package uh, encapsulates the uh, OpenCL C API pretty much one-to-one. -one. So if you, if you understand the OpenCL specifications, you'll understand what these functions do. And amongst them, there is one called CLNQ and the range kernel. And that one takes as an argument the kernel. The uh, work dimensions. And then the global work size. So this call here will execute the kernel in one dimension uh, 256 times. Now there's one thing left to do, the oncompute event handler of uh, the program node is not called implicitly. It's only called when you explicitly call the compute function. So let me go to the uh, on-time event handler and we'll call event call compute. This will now trigger uh, the oncompute event handler at every time step of the, when the application runs. Okay, so let's go back to the scene and start the application. Now. The only way to tell if this our kernel is running is if I look at the property sheet of the program. And this will give you profiling information here uh, when the kernel is running. And as you can tell, it's toggling between 3 and 4 microseconds. So we now know that uh, the kernel is executing. 
Now in this case, the kernel executes every time step because we call the compute function in the on time event handler. But we could easily, for example, insert a button here and only call the compute function when we press the button and it only execute the kernel at that time. So let's go ahead now and pass the buffer to the kernel. So for that, we go back to the script processor and go to the on compute event handler. And here now we're going to use uh, the CL package again. And we're going to set the kernel arc. And this function takes as a first parameter the kernel, second parameter the argument. And now we need to pass the buffer that we've created here in the tree view uh, as an argument. And so the buffer is located under the OpenCL subtree dot CL buffer. Now when I hit colon, there is a function here called get buffer. And this sum returns a CL mem buffer object. And basically, this is what you pass to an, uh, to an OpenCL program. Now this get buffer function, you'll find this at several places, uh, not just the one dimensional buffers, the two dimensional buffers, the three dimensional buffers, uh, the textures in the under the OpenGL sub tab, they all have a, a get buffer function. And you need to call this to get the proper object that you can pass to the set kernel arc. So now I've done that, I will compile the script. But I also have to change the kernel code to take the additional argument. In this case, we're passing a one dimensional buffer. Uh, it is of type. So we go look at the property sheet of the buffer. Uh, it's of type uh, U short. Uh, compile the change. And now let's go back to the scene view. And we look at the property sheet. You can now see the kernel is running. So we've effectively passed uh, this buffer here in the tree view to, uh, to the kernel. Now at this point I need to warn you uh, about some of the bugs in the underlying OpenCL drivers. If you left the kernel it was right now, requiring this uh, argument, and then went over to the script tab and you commented this out, and then went back to the scene tab to run this, uh, um, this application, it would crash. Um, for some reason, this version of the NVIDIA driver requires that you call the set kernel arc function if your kernel requires an argument. Previous drivers of uh, did not have this problem. So in general, the OpenCL drivers are still fairly immature and it, it can lead to crashes sometimes. This might not be caused by OpenCL Studio and sometimes it may. In any case, uh, you should save it, your, your work fairly frequently just in case something like that happens. So we'll now move on and show a few examples of how to pass different types of parameters to the kernel. So let's go ahead now and pass a simple integer value. So we're going to use the CL set kernel arc function again. And now we're going to pass as argument one a, an integer value. Now what we need to do here now is we need to specify the size of the parameter. And for that we have to go to the CL package. And we have to go to the member here. To pass CL int. And now we can pass a value. Now this tells uh, the, the scripting interface to interpret this, the, the following value as, as an integer and pass it as such to the kernel. Uh, note that this is very similar here on how you would achieve this in the corresponding uh, C function. So let's go over to the kernel and add another parameter here. And here we simply just go int, uh, call this v2. Compile our change, uh, go back, we've compiled the script, and go to the scene view, and simply just check whether the kernel is still executing. If there was any errors, um, they'd either be shown in the output pane and the application would stop, or the kernel would not execute and you would not see any profiling information here. So let's go ahead now and pass a float4 data type to the kernel. So we'll go back to the script Similar thing here, use the CL set kernel arc function again. 
uh, second argument. And now here we use CL, let's say flow four. And now we simply just have to pass four values to the Lua function. That's it, compile the script. We'll go back to the uh, kernel code. And now we simply just add a parameter flow four. Compile, go back to the scene and quickly check whether the kernel is running. Now note, I'm actually changing the scripts and I'm compiling the, the kernels while the application is running. In some instances, this works fine. In other instances, you may want to reset first before you start. Okay, now we'll show you how to pass a, a variable length local memory to the kernel. Now we'll go back to the script tab here. I'm gonna make another call the set kernel arc. So now we only specify one parameter and that's the size of the local memory we like. So for example, you want to pass uh, you know, 16 flop four values. So we'll go 16 times, and now we need to use the mem package. Uh, we'll talk about this more in a different uh, tutorial. And this is a size of function. And to the size of function, you pass a CL data type. Uh, let's choose the flop four. And that's all, compile the change. And in the kernel, it would look something like this. Okay, let me compile. Now, whatever you see in here is OpenCL kernel code. So this is all very well documented in the OpenCL specifications. So let me quickly go back to the scene view and have a look whether the kernel is still running. Yes, it is. So now we'll shortly talk about texture objects. Uh, go back to the tree view here and insert an image 2D. And when you look at the property sheet of this, um, you can see on the right hand side, there is a file browser. And that allows you to initialize this image object either with uh, a texture. So you can go over here, go to texture, double click on it. Now this image object is being initialized with this texture, the dimensions are being fixed and the channel order is fixed. And you can change some of the other attributes still. Or you could stream a video into this object. Just select the video, uh, wildlife.avi. Let me double click on it now. Every frame, every time step, a new frame of this video is automatically loaded into this image object. Now, of course, you can also pass that image buffer now to a kernel in a way similar to how we passed the one dimensional buffer earlier. Now, I also like to mention here that the code to load the, the images and the videos uh, is actually inside a Lua plugin module. This means that you can also load images and read videos from within the scripting interface. And it also means that the source code for the plugin, as well as the Visual Studio project to build it, comes with a distribution of OpenCL Studio. It's located in the current workspace. So you can either add your own image formats, your own video formats, and if you like, you can develop entire new plugins. And there is an additional tutorial dedicated to just how to do that. So now I'd like to talk about how to pass uh, OpenGL buffers, such as textures, uh, vertex attributes, or frame buffers, to OpenCL kernels. Now, the two languages have interoperability capabilities uh, built right into them, and OpenCL Studio implicitly calls all the functions necessary uh, to make OpenGL buffers available to OpenCL kernels. All you have to do them is pass them properly. So let me go for an example right now and uh, insert an OpenGL texture here under the OpenGL subtree. And if you look at the property sheet of the texture, uh, it looks quite similar to the property sheet of the OpenCL image 2D buffer. Simply these are very similar objects. And now if you'd like to pass that texture to our kernel, we have to go back to the script tab. So passing a texture as an argument is quite similar to how you'd pass a buffer. I'll use the set kernel arc function again. And now the texture is located under the OpenGL subtree. Dot GL texture, colon, 
And here you see again, there is a get buffer function that returns a CL mem object, which we can pass to an OpenCL function. So, but now this is not enough. Since we're passing an OpenGL buffer to an OpenCL kernel, we first have to acquire that buffer and afterwards release this. Now, this is part of the OpenCL specifications. That's just the way it is. And there's a function, uh, CL acquire GL objects. And to that, we need to pass our buffer. And after we're done with it, after we executed the kernel, we have to release it. Release GL object. And again, we need to pass the texture object. Okay, I'm going to compile the change and then go to the kernel code and add the corresponding parameter to the OpenCL kernel. And here you have to type something like this. So we're passing the texture as read only, like that v5. So if I now compile the change, go back to the scene view start and see if our kernel is running. And indeed it is. Now that OpenCL kernel could now effectively change a texture. And if that texture was mapped to a, an object, you, you would see that change reflected here in the uh, 3D visualization. Now in a similar manner that I've just shown you, you could also pass frame buffers to kernels for post-processing uh, effects. You could also pass the position of uh, point sets to kernels to do fluid rendering and particle rendering. Or you could even pass uh, the, uh, the canvases that you can create via the uh, the OpenCL Studio user interface widgets, and you can even pass those to kernels. So this sums up the overview on how to execute your own kernels in OpenCL Studio. Um, the idea was to keep the interface as simple as possible and reflect as close as possible the underlying OpenCL C API uh, as to minimize you know, the learning curve and so that you can rely on the, uh, the know-how that's already available online on the web. Another good idea is to always explore the demo models that come with OpenCL Studio. They make ex extensive use of this uh, API. So now I quickly like to talk about libcl, which is an open source parallel algorithms library that nicely integrates uh, with OpenCL Studio. Now libcl is completely standalone. It's its own C uh, library, but it, and it contains a growing number of uh, parallel algorithms that you can use here within OpenCL Studio. So I'll now go back here to the OpenCL subtree, uh, do a right mouse click, and you can see here on the bottom there's a pop-up menu called libcl. Now this one already contains a number of uh, objects, each of which contains an entire uh, OpenCL program. Now there is a tutorial on how to add extensions to libcl and then integrate them with OpenCL Studio so that your own algorithms appear here in this, uh, this subtree. But for now, let me just insert one and let's just uh, pick the recursive Gaussian. So now a new node here has appeared. I call it, it's called OCL Recursive Gaussian. And if you click on the code tab, you can now see this one already contains OpenCL kernel code. And here on the bottom, it shows you a file path to a .cl file that actually contains this code. Now, libcl is also distributed with OpenCL Studio and the latest version of it sits in the workspace directory, uh, including the Visual Studio project file to build it and all the source code. And this particular file now points to this version of libcl in the current workspace. And when you change this file, you're actually changing this .cl file. Now that is unlike the program node which we inserted earlier here. This one sits in the actual project file of this particular application and it doesn't have a representation of the file system. It's embedded in the project file. So now let's have a look at the interface of the recursive Gaussian. When I drag and drop this object here into the tree view, and let me type in event, you can now see this has a, a number of different functions. And amongst one of them is compute. Now this function now requires uh, arguments, which are a, a number of different buffers. And this function will now invoke the recursive Gaussian kernel that we have seen here under the code tab. And you, if you can see here, the, some of the parameters are similar to the ones that you pass to the compute function. 
Now you can use all of the uh, the objects in uh, LibCL as as building blocks like that for more complex applications. And if uh, one of the kernels doesn't work for you the way it is, you can change the code right here and compile it. But keep in mind that you're changing the current version of LibCL because you're overriding that file in the file system. Now, in order to fully explore the capabilities of LibCL, you can go over to the Help tab here and you click on the LibCL sub tab. And now here's a list of all of the algorithms that are currently available in the library. And then for every every algorithm, every object here, there is a, a description of the functions you can call, the buffers you have to pass, and so on and so forth. So the entire documentation is embedded in the editor. So this uh, sums up the introduction on how to use uh, OpenCL in the framework of OpenCL Studio. And there will be additional tutorials, um, in particular one on how to map the buffers from within the Lua script and actually initialize the buffers. And another one on how to uh, map the buffers as C structures and then access the, the fields of the structures from within the Lua scripting interface.